Please join me in welcoming Brian and Fred. We've got a great conversation. Well, thank you, and, and thanks for everybody for coming. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to tee up the conversation, uh, ask Brian a few questions, and then um, we're going to start taking questions from the audience. If you don't have questions, then I'm going to keep asking questions, but I have a suspicion that you've you got plenty of questions. So uh, we'll have a, you know, get it going, and then hopefully we'll turn this into something super interactive. Brian, we've got a lot of institutional customers uh, here tonight, um, and Sam just mentioned that uh, custody uh, passed a, a billion dollars uh, today or this week. Um, why does institutional matter so much to Coinbase? Yeah, well, you know, a few years ago, we, we were just getting started as a business, and uh, Coinbase really got started as a retail brokerage. And we realized at a certain point that for this industry to mature and really grow, we were going to have to bring in the institutional money out there. And I think like 90% of the money in the world is tied up in institution. It's not just in institutions. It's not just retail. So we started to go talk to these customers or potential customers at that time. And we said, what are some of the things that you need? And they really had a different set of requirements. And we went about going seeing if we could fulfill that, right? Um, so for instance, you know, Coinbase Custody is a New York Trust charter. Um, they needed a qualified custodian, a place to store these crypto assets before they could keep their LPs money there. Um, that's the kind of thing that didn't really exist in crypto at that time. And so, like many things that we've done, we decided to go out, let's, can we build like a really trusted piece of infrastructure in the space to start to draw more and more of this money in? So that was really the genesis of it. And um, I think as we've gotten going, you know, institutions have become a bigger and bigger part of our business. Um, we've started to enable features like OTC trading uh, through Coinbase Custody, uh, where these large block trades are starting to happen. And um, institutions have become, I think, 60% of our trading volume on Coinbase Pro as well. So um, these are a really key customer segment for us. And I think we're just going to keep investing more and more in it. And how do you think about the interaction between custody, OTC, um, Pro? You know, I mean, is the idea that they should all kind of interact with each other and, and have tight integration? Should, be, should you be able to tr trade right from, you know, assets that are in cold storage? Like, how does that all work? Yeah, so I think um, the market structure of crypto is sort of evolving, where it actually is really beneficial to have these, this separation. Um, a little bit like it, it has happened in the traditional financial system. Um, and it's really important that, you know, we have these custodians that are trusted, and all they do is they focus on having the assets be secure. You know, we, we've seen um, so many breaches of security in this industry. Um, you've, we've also seen scams, you know, and th this is exactly the sort of thing, like the Bernie Madoff thing. You know, if they had gone and done the diligence and called the custodians, they would have found out um, that the assets aren't there. And so that's why custodians are a really important part of that market structure. And then um, the exchanges and the brokerages, these are all, wh what we're seeing is really the foundational pieces of this next generation financial system um, come together. And that's really what I think um, crypto is going to be. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be this really new financial system that has all these kind of benefits. Some of the things will have counterparts to what was in Finance 1.0, which are sort of the early things that we're building. And then there's going to be some brand new things, too, that um, probably the world has never seen. So speaking of brand new things, um, Coinbase is now allowing customers to stake on the Tezos blockchain, and I assume that ultimately you will allow your customers to do these various, you know, kind of validation type um, uh, things on multiple blockchains. That is actually something that doesn't map very cleanly into the traditional world of finance. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how important that is to the institutional um, offering and how big of a deal you think that's going to be? Yeah, so that's a great example. Um, staking is one of these things that a lot of our customers came to us and they said, hey, we need to get the best return on our money and our LP's money as fiduciaries, and um, we're interested in this. And we had built this cold storage uh, system to store all of the crypto in Coinbase custody securely. Um, we can talk all about that if you want as well. But one of the really cool innovations that we created there was that you can actually earn staking uh, interest on funds that are stored entirely offline. And if anybody's curious, I can kind of get share a few details on that. But that's a great example of a new thing that didn't really exist in the traditional financial world. Some of the next things we're having customers come ask us about is uh, voting and on-chain governance. 
And uh, we're working right now to enable that for our institutional customers as well, because a lot of them are telling us, you know, if we make an investment in this asset, one way that we can be sure that the value of it goes up over time is uh, we want to participate in the governance and help ensure that it's making good, good uh, decisions on how to move forward. So we're, just to zoom out for a minute, actually, we think about this as um, in, in the crypto economy, there's kind of these nouns and verbs. The nouns are, um, you know, institutions, retail customers, even um, bots and dApps and any kind of um, entity. And the verbs are the way that they connect to each other. So some of them are, you know, some of the verbs are buy and sell and send and receive. Those have been around a long time. But we're seeing more and more new verbs come out like stake and vote. Um, ways that people and maybe spending crypto and like that's the that's going to be the next generation of of crypto crypto's evolution is it's not just an asset class where people are investing in it and they're speculating oh that's a great way that got all of us here in the room and you know 50 million people in the world to have crypto the next step is going to be to connect all those people into this economic graph almost like a social graph but um, you know the the verbs are the edges and the nouns are the nodes on the network so you, you touched on cold storage and security um, you know, I've been around uh, your company for a long time, and and you know, one thing that I've always um, uh, appreciated is the focus on security. And um, can you talk a little bit about like how you bake that into the DNA of the company, and and early on, and 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 how you know it has has been the case that Coinbase has sort of led the market in that? Yeah, so very early on, I remember um, you know, the company just had five or 10 people or so, and we realized that we needed to take a lot of this, these funds offline. And that was like really the first generation of our cold storage system. We're now on uh, the fourth generation. And um, I remember back in those days, I was just calling a bunch of people who are now in the industry, you know, Zuko, uh, from Zcash, I think r I saw Ryan Lackey somewhere. He's a security expert. I, I was like, you remember, I was calling you in San Francisco, like, um, how, do, how, do, how does uh, Samir's secret sharing work? And all the, I was asking him all these crazy questions. So, the, you know, the first version of it was pretty simple. We just had to get the majority of the funds offline. Um, but now we're on, you know, generation four of this architecture, and we've contemplated all kinds of disasters and things that could go wrong in the world. So anything from um, natural disasters uh, that you know disable all of California, or um, to you know people being uh, losing losing information, forgetting it, um, you know unpleasant scenarios that you could probably envision, solar flares um, that erase all the electronic data in the world. You know we've contemplated a lot of interesting solutions here. So today, um, you know the, the the offline funds that we keep, um, they're really split up amongst um, in these secure data centers all over the world. Um, and we have this data just encrypted offline with HSMs um, that can bring it back online. And there's no you know, small group of people in the world, myself included, who can, who can do this. It's a consensus mechanism where, you know, say, any five of the 10 pieces around the world are needed to come together. So that's been a huge first step, is get a lot of this offline and use that as a guarantee in the real world. The next thing we did was we went out and got a cybercrime insurance policy. So we were the first crypto company to do, to do that. And uh, to this day, I think we have the most robust uh, cybercrime insurance policy. It covers things like um, not only hacking by external individuals, but also um, an internal theft, um, you know, s loss due to bugs and accidents and things like that. And then the third thing we do is we actually hired a lot of firms to, to come try to break into Coinbase and steal crypto and then tell us how they did or did not do it or if they were unable to do it. And um, they do all kinds of things. Uh, these are called you know, red team drills for those who aren't in the security community. Um, so sometimes you will have people come pose as uh, employees interviewing or candidates interviewing at Coinbase and they'll come and you know, uh, in the middle of the night they're like plugging in thumb drives and trying to break into developer laptops. And um, you know, we run these rehearsals uh, several times a year to try to uh, learn where we have vulnerabilities in our system. And we've really architected it now in a way where we kind of assume that at any given time, uh, one or more developer laptops have been compromised. Um, if you look at a lot of the hacks that have happened out there in the industry, a lot of them boil down to um, malware and, you know, infecting developer machines, and they use that to escalate privileges to elsewhere and eventually run off with money. So we've kind of built our... Um, the code that you know s really stores money, like our hot wallet on the server, it's designed and it assumes that uh, any um, 
one or more developer laptops could be compromised at any time and the funds are still safe. Got it. Well, let's, let's open it up for questions. Um, if, if there aren't any, I can keep asking all night long, but uh, I suspect that all of you um, have some things that are on your mind and you want to ask about. Uh, what do you think the uh, overall technology industry needs to do to make uh, cryptocurrency more secure? Think people outside of cryptocurrency, the platform vendors and everyone else, what are the missing technology elements? You know, a lot of it, we can talk about all the challenges crypto. I mean, crypto is facing security challenges. It's also usability, you know, scalability, volatility. Um, in, in particular, the security side, I mean, one thing that we're trying to do is just um, enable a lot of this technology we've built, uh, making it available to third parties through APIs. Um, and, you know, almost like <laughs> AWS for crypto or something like that. I think that would help a lot of companies get off the ground so they don't have to rebuild that from scratch. Um, you know, thing, technologies like HSMs, hardware security modules that are starting to appear in cloud solutions, um, those, are, those go a long way as well. But it's just like any one tool, like if you don't know how to use it, it's not effective. Um, you know, I, anybody who's in the cybersecurity community right now, I think, has really good job security. <laughs> they're, they're in short demand and, you know, everybody is scared to death of it. Coinbase is probably the best user experience, bar none, of any crypto company today, albeit as a centralized exchange. Um, what advice would you give to the decentralized application world that's just getting off the ground? Because I think, frankly, the user experience is horrible. Yeah. Coming from a software engineering shop consensus that builds decentralized applications. Yeah, well, consensus has built a lot of really amazing apps, some with really good usability. So um, you're, you're right in the middle of this as well. Um, so the question, yeah, was how about how do we get better usability in these apps, especially the decentralized ones or the user-controlled wallets? And actually, Coinbase is playing in this space too with Coinbase Wallet. We've we've been encountering a lot of these challenges as well. Um, you know, a couple thoughts. One is that I think the whole space needs better usability. And one way I've given I've given a certain book to a lot of product managers on our team. Um, Bryce is here somewhere. I think I just gave him this book like last week, but it's called Don't Make Me Think by Steve Krug. Um, that's one of the classic books on usability. And it just puts you in this mindset of um, a user experiencing your product for the first time and, and you know, don't make them think. Like, why is that icon that way? I wonder what will happen if I click it. It's like, if you're making them think, you've already lost the game. Um, that's one thought. I think the other big thing, you know, if there's one thing that could make uh, user-controlled wallets really take off, um, it's that, you know, it's the forgotten password issue where if you lose your password, you've lost your funds. Or I guess another alternative or version of it is if you lose your device. And um, some of the recovery solutions there that we're all experimenting with as an industry, like um, encrypted backups in like Google Cloud or um, social recovery where, you know, five of your friends, yeah, um, those are all, or just ensuring people are signed in through multiple devices. I mean, those are all things where we can start to educate the world about how to, how to use those. Um, I do think for a long time, you know, institutions, <laughs> just to bring it back to the topic of today, uh, aren't going to want to kind of roll the dice on something like that. So I do think centralized third parties are, are you know, very necessary for a while, but both are going to grow enormously over time. When you say, in, just so I want to clarify, so we make sure Brian answers the question that, that you intend him to answer. Institutions would be institutional investors, and the incumbent ecosystem would be? Uh, well, all the exchanges, uh, people that are building uh, uh, distributed apps, um, and, and everyone that's already coming into this, uh, having spent a few years in this and developing applications, distributed it or not, any sort of application in the ecosystem of crypto versus institutions that are coming into this for the first time. I'm sure they have different asks, different ways of looking at what you're offering. How do you balance as a business with limited resources when you build for these two groups? Yeah, so 
there are, I think of it like two ends of the spectrum, but they're really kind of all one group uh, just along, along the spectrum. So there are institutions that are really crypto forward or crypto first institutions. Um, and the sorts of things they ask us about are, you know, often these more cutting edge things that Fred alluded to, like staking and voting. And are we supporting this new asset that they really want to trade? Um, so those are the questions that we get from them. And then, you know, on the other side of the spectrum, maybe a more traditional institution like, um, like a, an endowment or pension fund or, you know, um, asset manager, they might ask more about, um, you know, our SOC 2 audit or um, the New York Trust Charter and the qualified custodian status. And can you help us ensure that we don't get a qualified opinion with PwC on our financial return or our, um, our audits? So, you know, but what's interesting is that their questions are starting to have more and more overlap um, because right after they check the box on, you know, SOC 2, they're like, oh, yeah, and do, do you have staking? Um, so I think the industry, there's a lot of overlap in institutions and what they're wanting, and um, we're really just working as hard as we can to hear those requests and build them. Yeah, I mean, I'll, as, as a Coinbase director, I'll just say that one of the things that has impressed me about uh, this company is their ability to actually do both of those things at the same time, to do the things that are required to support you know, sophisticated institutions and also continue to execute at the cutting edge of crypto and the tech in crypto. And I think that's why they've established their position in the marketplace is that, you know, they have, have built and resourced the company to do both of those things. And that, that's unique in my view. Actually, before we move on, Fred Wilson, can I ask you a question? Yes, you can. I'll put, put you in the hot seat. Okay. So I, I remember back in 2012, you know, I was a software engineer all by myself, kind of thinking about a company that might start. And I remember reading um, some of your blog posts around that time. I think it was late 2012. You know, Fred has a very famous blog, if you haven't read it. And I remember you posting about Bitcoin. And you said something like, I know everyone, you know, everybody thinks this is a scam or whatever, but I think this is a big deal. And people should be paying more attention to this. And I can feel it in my bones or something like that. And at that moment, I had a little light bulb go off in my head, which was, man, if I ever start a company, I want to raise money from this guy. He, he seems like he's, um, he's, he's contrarian, but he's not afraid to say what he thinks. Um, that was a very unpopular opinion at that time. And now most VCs are, you know, it's the other way. They're knocking on our door instead of me knocking on 50 doors and getting 50 no's. So I guess my qu question for you, and you saw this with the internet and all these things, how do you how do you do that as an investor? Like what when you're looking at some new thing that's happening, you know how do you make up your mind that this is going to be something interesting? Well, I think a couple couple things I try to do. Um, one is I try to always force myself to think about what the next thing is going to be, as opposed to what the current thing is going to be, because it's relatively easy to get caught up in the current thing. Um, you know, uh, companies that are growing super quickly and going public and, and all those things, they're, they're excited, those are exciting things, but they're not the next thing, right? And so if you, if you don't kind of force yourself to say, what's out there on the horizon? What, 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 is, what is that going to be? Then, then you, 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 you will just kind of continue to spend your time and energy focused on the same things everybody else does. So one is just like making it a point every single day to try to force yourself out there. And then the second thing is um, to have like some basic kind of um, uh, pattern recognition or just like some way to kind of tell, oh, this is going to be big. And, and the thing that, that Bitcoin had that reminded me of the internet was that it was this decentralized thing that um, that didn't have like a didn't have an owner at the core of it, right? Like when they, when I first found out about the internet back in the early '90s, I was like, yeah, "But who owns it?" And it was like, "Well, nobody owns it. It's like this this network, this decentralized network." And you know, people explained to me it was designed this way by the Defense Department so that it couldn't be you know taken out. You know, so there was no centralized thing to take it out. And I always kind of like that always kind of stuck at me like, wow, that that was the central design paradigm to create the resiliency. And it also turned out to be important in a lot of other ways. So when Bitcoin, Bitcoin came along and I was like, it was explained to me that, you know, here's a way to create money and lots of other important things without a 
central you know entity i was like that's important like i didn't really even it wasn't even much more than that sometimes it's better i think to just keep things simple right and like my partner albert was like yeah but you know do you understand how the consensus mechanism works no, not really. <laughs> do, you know, uh, do you understand how the inflation model works? No, not really. You know, and he was like kind of beating me up a little bit about that. And I was like, but here's what I can tell you. Like, this is going to be a big fucking deal. Like, we need to invest in this thing. So you got to get over your shit, and we got to figure out how to invest in it. <laughs> Actually, that's one thing I love about your style is that um, you don't overcomplicate things. I remember like five years ago, I called you on the phone. I was like really torn up about whether I should hire this particular person. I don't remember who it was at this point, but I, I was like giving you all these reasons why I should and all these reasons why I shouldn't. And you, you just kind of paused and you were like, you probably don't even remember this. <laughs> you, you were just like, Brian, do you want to work with this person? <laughs> and I was like, part of me was mad. That's his only advice? Like, <laughs> God damn it. You know, this <laughs> but then I thought about it. I was like, that's actually the most important question. <laughs> and then I knew the answer instantly. I like, your, how, I like how, your ability to make it simple. That's how I went about finding a partner uh, when we started USV. Um, that was my number one rule. Is I, I can't be a partner with somebody that I, that I don't enjoy working with, right? And so um, I just kept looking around until I found somebody. I mean, it was also important that they could do a lot of other things, but that was my number one rule. And, and I, I still think in hiring, it's the number one rule. It's like, you know, is this person going to get along with others? And me. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, that was a cool trip down memory lane. Sorry. All right. Here we go. Uh, maybe just to, to stay down memory lane for a second, could, could you talk about uh, when you first raised money from Fred, what sort of that conversation was like, what your vision was at the time, and, and how that went? Well, I, I'll tell a story, um, and then Brian can, can talk about how he decided we were the right ones. Um, I met Brian when he was at Y Combinator in the summer of 2012, and um, Paul Graham had asked me to come in and do something called Office Hours, where I met with 16 founding teams over the course of four hours. You do the math, it's every 15 minutes. And, um, and I walked out of there in a little bit of a, like a daze, because 16 pitches in four hours is a lot of pitches. And you gotta be, the thing you have to be in that moment is you have to be in it with the, each and every team. You gotta be listening, you gotta be poking, like, because if you're not, like, then what the fuck are you doing, right? So um, I walk out and Paul Graham's at the door and he's like, so what'd you think? And I was like, there was this one company that I really liked, um, Coinbase. And he's like, Coinbase? And I said, yeah. And he says, you know, you're the first venture capitalist to like, you know, pick that one. And I said, yeah, I just think this Bitcoin thing's gonna be big. And I love Brian. And it's just like, if he ever raises money, like I wanna invest in that company. So it really, like, even back before they even wanted to raise money, I raised my hand and said, you know, pick me. And then of course, he did, so you got to talk about why you picked me. <laughs> yeah. So probably six months after that, we were thinking about doing our Series A and, you know, went out, did a pitch, 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 pitch all over Sand Hill Road. And um, we only got, we got one party that, that was interested. They sent us a term sheet. It wasn't a very good term sheet. It, it, not only did it have, like, every bad term, like liquidation preference and everything in it, um, it also included the right to fire me as CEO if um, they weren't happy with my performance in the next year or something like that. And um, so that wasn't very encouraging. And then, um, and then I was like, man, this, this fundraising thing is tough. Luckily, we got a second term sheet um, from, from Fred Wilson. And um, this actually influenced my negotiation style later in life, which was you didn't set up like some people send a term sheet and they put all these owner's terms because they're kind of bracketing the negotiation and there's going to be this war of attrition where you finally end up in the middle somewhere. Fred just sent me like good terms. It was like everything is very entrepreneurial, entrepreneur friendly. Um, I think we had like one back and forth and you raised the price a little bit and then we're just done. It was, we were done. And so I've actually used that later in negotiation, which is um, if I really, if I want to do something, I just send them like a good offer on the first one. I don't try to, you know, set them up for some long negotiation. Um, so that was, that was how we got the deal done. And the, I think the other thing that I like to do is I like to um, not have any, like, exclusivity or exploding offer or anything. I like to just say, like, here it is. You know, call me in a week, call me in a month, call me in a year. If you want to do a deal on these terms, 
I'll do it. Shop it to everybody up and down Sound Hill Road if you can find a better deal and you think they're a better person. The thing I found about that is that it it's like it's it's very in a way it's a little arrogant because it's very confident. It's like I think you're ultimately going to choose us, but it also it doesn't it doesn't like express any desperation either, right? Like it says to the entrepreneur, this is a pretty confident investor and, you know, they're not worried about whether I take a week or a month to figure this thing out. I also think like it is, you know, we're sitting here six plus years after, you know, we made that decision to, you made the decision to let us invest and we made the decision to invest. Um, so it seems to me kind of weird that you would give somebody an exploding offer like, you have to take this offer in the next 24 hours as a way to get into what's a six-year relationship, probably going to be a, a, a lot longer than that. So that's sort of my philosophy about these things. Yeah, I wish it was more common. <laughs> All right, one more question. All right, who has one? All right, got one here. All right, got the last one. So um, we'll be talking about institutions tonight, right? So, but I actually do want to raise a bit of a question about uh, the Coinbase next step. Uh, I guess steps towards a more a little bit more retail focus, right? So we noticed that you know uh, Columbia has made some moves into the more of the auto companies things last year. So is there any plan going forward from Columbia to actually go say listing more uh, I would say I would say cutting edge innovative uh, projects that are actually issuing different types of tokens that touch base on every aspect of the blockchain? Yeah, so um, you know are we going to keep adding more more assets for retail or institutional? And I, let me just share how I think about that. Broadly, so number one, let's start with institutions. So, um, institutions should be able to, you know, custody any asset they want, really, um, and that's going to be the most permissive. That's where you're going to see the most assets available on Coinbase. Um, as our chief legal officer explained one time to a regulator who was visiting, institutions should be able to custody a ham sandwich if they want to. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, consumers. Uh, we also, by the way, ha we have like accredited investors who trade on Pro. You know, they're they're probably going to see fewer assets, but still the vast majority of them. Basically, anything that's not, um, you know, a scam or something like that. And then on consumer, um, you're going to see fewer assets uh, because there are a lot of consumer protection laws that are in place for a good reason. Um, but um, you know, you're we are going to continue to list more and more assets there as well. So here here's the shift in my mind. Um, when crypto started off, you know, it was really just Bitcoin, and then we later added w another one, another one, and there was one model of the world which was, you know, we're only going to put this small set of curated assets on Coinbase, and we're going to be sort of the ar arbiters of good taste, <laughs> if you will, and that was almost like, you know, Yahoo in the very early days of the internet. They tried to like list all the good websites like right on their homepage, but quickly it became this world where there was millions of web pages and then billions of web pages, and what's What's happened is that we're now in a world where um, we should not be the arbiters of good taste. We should just be agnostic and, and letting our customers trade anything um, that's not a scam. And what we're going to do to inform our customers is create these asset pages. Um, you know, there's there's should be at some point you know ratings or reviews and things like that. So, you know, it's like if you go to Amazon, there might be some product that has two out of five stars, and you can decide to buy it or not. But everything is listed there. Or similarly, if you go to Google, you know, if it's not not every web page on the internet is, is there. It's not a complete search index. But the best ones are going to be listed first or have the best ratings. Um, and that's the world I think we're moving to um, in crypto. So, yeah. So we'll, we'll wrap up with that. Um, if any of you are thinking about becoming um, a customer of Coinbase Custody, we would love to speak with you. Anybody here with a uh, Coinbase name tag or Sam, um, we'd be happy to talk to you and help you get set up in the world of crypto We trading. just onboarded a bunch of our new funds, and it was really simple. I was shocked how easy it was. So I was prepared to go through the kind of pain in the butt that go I go through when I open an account at J.P. Morgan Chase, and Coinbase was a hell of a lot easier than that. So well done. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Enjoy yourself. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks. <laughs>